Well, it's great to be with all of you today. Happy for the, another opportunity to study God's Word with you. Uh, in this morning's lesson, I'd like to talk about the proper attitude that we ought to have. So much of uh, what we do in service to God comes down to our attitude. Uh, we know that uh, God looks upon our hearts, and that has to do with our attitude that's in our hearts and our motives, what we're uh, striving to do. In looking at uh, the subject of attitude, what is an attitude? Well, it's a settled way of thinking or feeling about someone or something, typically one that is reflected in a person's behavior. So we want to make sure we get our uh, attitude right so that we might be able to get our behavior right so that we might be able to please God in all the things that we do. It has to do with the point of view, a frame of mind, a way of thinking. When you look it up in a thesaurus and think about synonyms for attitude, it's comparable to disposition, outlook, or approach one has to a subject or a principle confronting one. What is our attitude as we approach life and God and our fellow man. It's only found eight times the word uh, attitude in the New American Standard Bible. Um, the idea or principle is found often, though, in the expressions of Scripture. Uh, phronio is the word in Greek for mental, mentally disposed or being earnestly, uh, have your mind directed in, in a certain way. And it is translated by this idea of attitude. So there are a number of principles that involve attitude in the Word of God. We can see it from the very beginning of Jesus' teaching that we need to clean up our attitudes and set them in the right direction if we want to be successful as Christians and please the Lord. So we find them right off when Jesus begins to talk about the basic principles of His kingdom. It has to do with attitudes. We call them the Beatitudes that Jesus lists. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. A person has to have an attitude. I cannot save myself by my perfect works, my own goodness, but I need to depend upon God for His direction spiritually and His way of saving my soul. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We need to have an attitude of mourning over, uh, in this spiritual context, uh, the spiritual death of our soul when we commit sin. There needs to be a godly sorrow in order for a person to be led to repentance and salvation. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. A gentle is somebody who has their powers under control, just like a tame horse has his power uh, harnessed and put under control so that he'll go the way his master says. We need to be gentle and under control of God and his will. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. You have to have a desire and a hunger to be not just a little bit right, but all the way right with God in all the aspects of your life. You want all the righteousness you can get, and you hunger and thirst for it, Jesus says. That's your goal. That kind of person will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. We need to have an attitude as we want to have mercy on our sins. We have to be merciful to other people and desire uh, that they be saved and that they come to repentance. So there has to be a merciful attitude for us to receive mercy. Blessed are the, poor, are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. To be pure is to be singular in your heart, not having mixed motives. And you have to have a singular devotion to the Lord. Have a desire to uh, honestly serve Him from your heart. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. There has to be an attitude of seeking peace between God and man, between ourselves and God, and then with our fellow man and our fellow Christian that we want harmony, and that is a desire that's in our heart. These things will cause us to be like the Son of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men cast insults at you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. 
We have to have an attitude of mind that we are willing to suffer for what is right, for Jesus Christ. And that's the way the prophets behaved in the Old Testament. And we want to be like the prophets, sons of the prophets. We need to have an attitude. We're going to do right and not be ashamed, but serve the Lord. And in that kind of attitude, we'll be successful spiritually and we'll get the heavenly reward in the end. A good attitude uh, puts one not far from the kingdom of God, Jesus said to one of the scribes that came to question him. Uh, Jesus gave a great answer when he asked about what's the great commandment. To so love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind. And to love your neighbor as yourself, he said, was the second commandment. And that scribe may have been used as an instrument to try Jesus or tempt him on behalf of the Pharisees and the chief priests. But he listened intelligently. He was honest when he heard what Jesus had to say. And we're told in Mark 12, 34, And when Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one ventured to ask him any more questions. Jesus looked at this man's attitude, right? He had an attitude, an attitude of honesty, where he was going to weigh things not based on his prejudice in his heart, but he was going to look at the facts as Jesus presented them. He weighed them honestly. And Jesus said, if you've got a good and honest heart like that, you're not far from the kingdom of God. When somebody shows you further things about how to obey the gospel and so on, this man very likely may have the right response, right? It's all about attitude of mind. We need to have an attitude where we are seeking the most excellent things. We're not shooting at the minimum. We're shooting at the maximum. We're shooting for perfection in all of our thoughts and actions. And Paul says that's the way we need to fix our minds, our attitude. In Philippians 4 and verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. So we need to have this desire for moral excellence. That's what we're shooting for. We want the very best morals, the very best kind of character, the very best standard that we can live up to is our goal each day that we live. We fix our minds upon that. The word there means to reckon or to take account of. It's an accounting word. We take account of what is it that has the greatest value in God's word for us to be. What is the type of character? Well, it's to be like Christ. To think like God thinks about morality and about religion. And we're going to value that, meditate on that, and try to live our life that way because of that attitude. So it leads us to good works. It causes you to shun sin and avoid sin. want to eliminate it from your life in every way that you can. And it leads, of course, to, in the end, a transformation so that you are transformed in to the image of Christ when it comes to your character. It's a lifelong pursuit that we're all engaged in. What's our attitude? Are we uh, those that have set our mind on the excellent or just enough to get by? Attitude is what matters. The value of having the proper attitude. Think about what this produces for you. It produces determined actions. That's what ends up happening. You want to, ch- you want to change your life, you've got to change your the way you're thinking and what you have your, as your goals. If you don't have a, a, a purpose that you're shooting for, you're not ever going to reach the things that need to be reached. The things that cause people to go astray is because they don't have their minds fixed on the truth and loving the truth and wanting what Jesus Christ has to say and what His doctrine is, that that's not the most important thing Those are the ones that fall away from Christ. I don't want to fall away. I don't want any of you to fall away. We're told about a great apostasy that was going to happen and there'd be a man of sin revealed. There'd be a false system of religion that's going to come on the world and people are going to, uh, they're going to use false miracles and signs and wonders to try to deceive people. And we're told why it is certain ones will fall away. 
In 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 10 through 12, And with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth, so as to be saved. And for this reason God will send upon them a deluding influence, so that they may believe what is false, in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. We're in a time right now in our lives, living in this world, um, where we're on probation, right? We're living at a period of time where it's going to be shown whether we love the truth and are going to serve God and whether we are going to be justified on that last day of judgment or we're going to be condemned. And it's going to come down, do we love the truth? What was our attitude towards truth? That's going to determine the outcome. It says there are some that don't love the truth. They don't value the truth enough to resist false doctrine, to study things out. And as a result, they end up just taking pleasure in wickedness, in what pleases them. They go with the false religion. They go with what is popular, and they fall away. So we're told that we need to make sure we love the truth. In Proverbs 23, 23, the writer of wisdom there says, Buy truth and do not sell it. Get wisdom and instruction and understanding." We've got to love the truth. The truth's got to mean something to us. It's got to be something that we want to spend what we have to in time and effort to arrive at what the truth is in God's Word. And then we don't ever give it up. We never sell it. We never let it go. Christ is the truth. He is the way and the truth and the life in John 14, 6. The Spirit that's coming to guide the apostles is the Spirit of truth. And the thing that He's going to guide them in is all of the truth. So we know where that truth is. It's in the words of the New Testament. And we need to strive to understand that truth and love it and follow it. Attitude of abiding to the end. How important is that as a proper attitude for a Christian to have? That you're never going to give up. You're never going to let go of Christ. You're never going to let go of His way. You're going to stay in there no matter what trials and disappointments are going to come into the church and into this world and into your life. You're not going to let go of the Lord. You're going to stay faithful until death. That's the attitude that we have to have. It's those that endure to the end that will be saved, we're told in Matthew 24, 13. It's those that went through those trials that the devil was throwing the church into in Revelation 2, 10 that were faithful until death. Those are the ones that get the crown. And we need to have that kind of attitude. And when it talks about attitude, we need to have the attitude towards the world that we are not going to love this world. And I'm talking about the wicked world that's all around us. That's the world that's being talked about. The world in opposition to God. Not the birds and the bees and the flowers and the trees. Not that world. It's talking about the spiritual world that follows the devil. That's the world you can't be a part of. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away, and also its lust. But the one who does the will of God abides forever. You've got to hang in there to the end. Do God's will all the way. And you will live forever. We're going to be faithful to the end and not love the world. Paul obeyed to the end and he knew when he was looking at his death that there was going to be a departure there to go and be with Christ and there was reward on the other side of death. He said in 2 Timothy 4 and verses 7 and 8, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved His appearing. Paul had great confidence that he was going to lay hold on that reward. He had fought the fight. He had kept the course God gave for him with all his heart. He tried to do what was right. He had depended on the sacrifice of Christ to forgive his sins. So... He was a man that had confidence he was going to get that crown at the end of the road. 
because he'd stayed faithful to the end. We need to have that attitude. Some other proper attitudes that the Bible teaches us about have regard to our duty towards God and how we should serve Him. We should not consider our earthly life to be the thing that's most important to us. The thing that's most important to us is the service to God and to carrying out the the ministry that He's given to all of us to do. Uh, Serve Him and to be the type of servants we should be and share the gospel with others. The Apostle Paul was picked out on the road to Damascus by the Lord to be an apostle. And Paul didn't prove disobedient to that call because he had the proper attitude. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 24, But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, in order that I may finish my course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus, to testify solemnly to the gospel of the grace of God. Paul weighed things out. And even though there was dangers at Jerusalem, there were prophecies about him being bound and put in prison, he was happy to go on to Jerusalem because that was his duty to go there and share the gospel, go there and to do what the Lord wanted to have done. And so he didn't count his own life as dear to himself, this physical life, but he put the Lord's world, word first. Living for Christ to Paul was gain right now if he lived. He was going to glorify God and glorify Christ and do their will and bear fruit. If he died, it was going to be even greater gain because he'd go to be with the Lord. In Philippians 1, 21 through 23, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which to choose. But I am hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. So Paul had an attitude, didn't he? If I live, I'm going to serve God and I'm going to bear fruit. If I die, I'm going to go and be with Christ, and that is even better. (laughs) So either way, I win-win. I'm going to win for the Lord, and I'm going to win for myself by serving Him. Suffering for Christ, Paul did not feel ashamed. Here he was, beaten in public, locked up in prison as a criminal, but he didn't feel ashamed. And he didn't want Timothy to ever feel ashamed of preaching the gospel and suffering for the gospel. And he doesn't want any of us to feel ashamed. You've got to have an attitude to mind that you're glorifying God and uh, it is, uh, you're, you're putting yourself right there with Christ and the prophets that were before, that you suffer for what's right. And don't feel ashamed of that. In 2 Timothy 1 and verse 12, For this reason I also suffer these things. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Paul lived with confidence. He lived with confidence if he served the Lord faithfully and strove to do His will, that he was going to be saved when it was all said and done. So he wasn't ashamed of what men might do to him. He knew who Jesus was. He had a relationship with Him. And he believed, He'll keep my soul that I've entrusted to Him until that last day. And with that great confidence, one doesn't need to feel ashamed. So... Live your life faithfully. Confess your sins. Repent of your sins. And stay right with the Lord and trust Him. The proper attitude towards gospel truth. Above all desire to know and practice the truth. We have to have a love for that truth as we've read before. When Jesus prayed for His apostles about how they could be kept from the evil one and that they would be safe, The Lord would be with them. God would be with them. He said, John 17, 17, Sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. The thing that can set them apart from sin and keep them away from the devil and dedicated to God is the word of truth. We know the truth is Jesus Christ and His doctrine. That's the truth. And that's what can keep us there. Place Christ and His truth before everything else and everybody else. But that comes first. There are many times in life where people want to make us choose. Well, if you love me, you'll do this or that. But the Lord tells us to do the opposite. We have to stick with the Lord. We have to go with Him. He has to come first. 
In Matthew 10, 37, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. See the attitude of mind that we have to have to do our duty? We have to have the attitude, the truth of Christ and His cause, it comes first. We have to say no to parents and we have to say no to our children. That We have to do so because the Lord's truth and His will comes first in our life. Seek always to obey God and not men. Uh, the apostles were ordered by the government at that, in that day, the high court, not to preach in Jesus' name, not to preach the gospel anymore. But Peter and the apostles answered and said, We must obey God rather than men. We have to have the proper priority. We have to have the proper stance of attitude that God's will must be obeyed. Even above the laws of the state, we have to do God's will. If they come in conflict, we need to do God's will and be willing to suffer the consequences if necessary to do God's will. Paul, when he went out to preach the gospel, it's always nice to have people uh, think well of you and to pat you on the back. But Jesus said, woe to us if all men speak well of us, because that's what they do with false teachers. Now, we've got to teach... Uh, what pleases God. That has to be the priority in our attitude. In Galatians 1.10, for am I seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Paul had all kinds of praise of men when he was in Judaism and he was following the way of the Pharisees. Oh, he was uh, highly exalted in the minds of his fellow countrymen and his family. But he counted all of that as rubbish to gain Christ and salvation. And so he was then dedicated from then on to pleasing Christ and to teaching what Christ says is the truth. And he wasn't seeking the favor of men. He sought to save men, but he didn't seek to please them in place of pleasing God. We need to have the proper attitude towards the Scripture. It is the source of that truth that we're to love and that we're to uh, desire and that sanctifies us. It's the Word of God is the final word. In all religious endeavors that we are engaged in, all of the principles and problems that we have to figure out, it's all revealed in God's Word. And we need to dedicate ourselves to studying that Word because we know it's what can make us adequate to please God and to be the type of servants we should be. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So all that we need to be what God wants us to be and to get to heaven is in God's Word. And we need to follow it. In 2 Peter 1 and verse 3, seeing that His divine power is granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. To the apostles was given everything concerning spiritual life and how to have a true religion, godliness, a proper attitude of God toward God in His service. And he says it's there. When we get a true knowledge of Jesus Christ, and uh, He gave it to us by His own glory, His own power and excellence gave this to us. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 26, And he said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read? You want to know what's right? Look into the law. Let's study it. Let's find out what it has to say. Let's take all of the scriptures. The sum of God's word is truth. So let's take everything the Bible has to say about it. In 2 John chapter 9, or chapter 1 verses 9 through 11, Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. So Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. He is the Son of God and he is the Savior. If someone uh, doesn't abide in that teaching, they're not going to have God. The proper attitude towards life. Consider yourself a stranger and a pilgrim on the earth. 
and somebody that's going to be judged on the last day by the Word of God. That's the proper attitude towards life. I'm only here temporarily. Uh, and it's a fact. It's just facing reality, really, that we are only here for a limited period of time. Life flies by. And it gets faster, it seems, the older you get, the quicker it goes. And we're not going to be here very long. So how should we regard ourselves? Just temporary dwellers here. Right? We are living and hoping to live in an upper and better country. We're wanting to have a house whose foundation is built by God and provided by Christ. That's eternal in the heavens. That's what we're looking for. So while we live on earth, Christians are encouraged to have the attitude, you are a stranger and an alien in this world. These things going on in this world are very temporary things. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the residents, those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia and Bithynia, who are chosen. Is that the way you view yourself? You're a resident alien in this world. That's the way it should be. That's the attitude we should live with. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 17, And if you address as Father the one who impartially judges according to each man's work, conduct yourself in fear during the time you stay upon earth. We're just here on earth for a limited period of time. Therefore be obedient to our Heavenly Father. Show respect and reverence for Him because it won't be long till we'll be going to meet Him. In John 12 and verse 48, in Jesus' last words to the people, He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. It's going to be the words that God gave Jesus to speak, the ones he didn't speak on his own initiative, but he preached what God wanted him to preach. Those are the words that are going to judge people on the last day. So let's look at our life and understand that it is a very short period of time, and then we go to judgment. We need to abide in the Word to be true disciples. That's sort of a bottom line principle, isn't it? Jesus came and showed us the attitudes and the ways that we should live, and if we really want to be a true disciple of Christ, that He'll recognize. People of the world might not recognize it, but Christ will recognize you if you abide in His teaching. You go by His teaching, you don't ever leave it. In John 8, 31 and 32, Jesus therefore was saying to those Jews who had believed Him, If you abide in My word, then you are truly disciples of Mine, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So have an attitude of mind. We're going to abide in the truth, not going to leave it. Well, brethren, I hope these basic evidences will recharge our minds, reset our attitudes, so that we'll rededicate ourselves to follow these Bible principles and put these things that are priorities first in our minds. This time we want to bow in a word of prayer and be dismissed to our classes.